we are in Colossians on chapter 1. Take up the reading of verse 1 of the chapter, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, he also declared unto us your love in the Spirit, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn, of every creature. And God will add his blessing to this reading from his precious word of truth. Let's take time just to pray together briefly before we minister God's word. Our Father, we bow very humbly in your presence this morning. We give you thanks for the great privilege that is ours to gather together collectively in order that we might worship thee. And our Father, we know that the absolutely vital thing in any meeting is to know the presence of the risen Christ in our midst and to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking in our hearts. And our Father, we pray that that might be our experience this morning. We pray, Lord, that you'll take the clay lips of the speaker, take his mind, take his lips, take his tongue. Pray, Lord, that he'll simply be an instrument in the hand of God. And Father, we do pray that this meeting will be for the glory of God, and for the blessing of your people. We make our request in the Savior's name and for his sake and glory alone. Amen. Friends, it's a very special day in the history of the Lifeboat Fellowship because today you celebrate your pastor's 29th anniversary in this place ministering the word of God. And of course, friends, uh, I have known Pat and Bertie for many years and uh, it's a real privilege for me to share in this special meeting today. You know, when I left the police and went to Bible college, I discovered that Bertie, also a former police officer, uh, had done exactly the same thing. And he and I were in Bible college together. Didn't take long until we discovered that we both shared the same convictions uh, biblically. And of course, uh, by the grace of God, we sought to take our stand for what we believed. And uh, I can tell you, we weren't flavor of the month in uh, some Christian circles because of the stand that we took. After college, we missioned together in County Armagh and also in County Antrim. And precious souls were saved. And there were many who expressed blessing. You know, in the years that have gone into eternity, God has blessed Bertie and Pat. And he has blessed 
richly bless their ministry here in this place, the development and progress of the church, the salvation of many souls, and the spiritual growth in the lives of many of God's people. Well, bear witness. Bear witness to the blessing of God, the rich blessing of God upon their ministry. And as we look back over the past 29 years of the history of this fellowship, we have every reason to be thankful to God. Friends, I think we could say that there is one that we have good reason to be thankful to, and there are great blessings that we have good reason to be thankful for. And of course, with that in mind, my text this morning is Colossians chapter 1, verses 12, 13. They read, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Friends, those blessings are something that every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ has very good reason to be thankful for. Whether or not you are familiar with the blessing of God here in this place or not. My dear friends, we ought to be extremely thankful to God this morning. Why? Because we have a caring Heavenly Father. You will observe that verse 12 does not read giving thanks unto God. doesn't read that way. Rather, friends, it reads giving thanks unto the Father. And those two words, the Father, give expression to two very wonderful truths. The relationship that we have with the eternal, sovereign, almighty God and the relationship that the sovereign, eternal, almighty God has with each of us. And I'm reminded immediately of that pattern prayer that the Lord Jesus Christ taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven. Friends, how privileged we are. We stand in family relationship to the almighty, supreme, and sovereign God, and the almighty, supreme, and sovereign God stands in a family relationship to each and every one of his children. You know, in Scripture, we are encouraged to come before him boldly in prayer and supplication, invoking that family relationship as we make our petitions to him. And of course, friends, it is a great privilege that belongs to every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ in this church age. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, the chapter is entitled Moses' Song, and his song portrays God as a father, as a father who creates, loves, supports his unique family, Israel. And it is God's family care, fatherly care of the nation of Israel that is emphasized. But when we come into the New Testament, friends, the fatherhood of God is emphasized in relation to the individual believer. As many as receive Christ, to them gives he the power or the authority to become the sons of God. They are declared to be born of God, which means that they have been spiritually born into the family and fold of God. My dear friends, every believer, doesn't matter, doesn't matter what your background is, you might only be saved just just a few hours, but every believer without exception has the wonderful privilege of calling God their Father, unsaved person 
lifts up their heart to God and calls God Father by their friends, they're speaking a lie because God is not their Father. You're saved this morning. Understand this. God is your heavenly Father. And he exercises over you a heavenly Father's care. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry emphasized the reality of that relationship to his disciples and the blessings and the privileges that result from it. For example, he was at pains to point out the care of God for his children. Behold the fowls of the air, he said, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. He was at pain to point out the goodness of God towards his children. Matthew chapter 7, verses 9 to 11, the Lord Jesus said, What man is there of you if a son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. Now I want you to get the next wee bit. How much more? Get a grasp of that. How much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things unto them that ask him? Friends, in both these scriptures, it is the individual and his relationship with God that is emphasized. Friends, may this wonderful truth May it it strengthen our hearts this morning. May, May that wonderful truth, friends, govern our thinking. One of his many attributes is goodness. The psalmist reveled in the truth of God's goodness. And I often reflect on this psalm I often turn to it. It's a favorite psalm of mine, Psalm 27. And in that psalm, and mind you, the psalmist was compassed about with adversity. You read that psalm. And and, and at a time in his life, he was compassed about with adversity. His enemies were gathering up against him. And this is what he said. He said, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Friends, our Heavenly Father cares. He passionately cares for his children. The Apostle Peter could write, casting all of your cares upon him, for he careth for you. Friends, it's a wonderful truth to lay hold of when the storms of adversity are blowing about us. You know, in the Shankill Church, there is a very dear lady who has had more than her fair share of physical pain and suffering. Few knew or understood the physical pain that this dear lady had been called upon to endure. Yet, friends, she bore her trials and troubles with uncomplaining, uncomplaining patience and fortitude. I often visited her in hospital, and I often visited her in her home. And the phrase that was repeatedly on this dear lady's lips was, My Heavenly Father, friends, with confidence, She had placed her burdens, her cares, her physical condition into his hands, conscious of her relationship with God, conscious of God's relationship with her. The hymn writer expressed it so well, didn't he, when he penned those words, Behold what love, what boundless love the Father hath bestowed on sinners lost that we should now be called the sons of God. But I want you to see this morning that there are great blessings for us to be 
truly thankful for. Paul says, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. And the first thing I want you to notice this morning, the first thing I want you to get a hold of this morning is this. It's the Father who has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. It's the Father who has delivered us from the power of darkness. It's the Father who hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Harry Arnside refers to these blessings from God the Father as being non-forfeitable. They are blessings we cannot lose. We might describe them as the permanent blessings that our Heavenly Father has bestowed upon us. Did any wonder, therefore, that we are to give thanks unto the Father on account of the wonderful things he has done for us. Now, let's take a moment this morning to consider just what those blessings are. Friends, we have been qualified. Paul says, giving thanks unto the Father who has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. There is a Greek word in this text that appears twice. Uh, It is translated by our English words, by those two words, made us and and meet. The English word, uh, the Greek word is hikanu, and of course it means to enable, it means to qualify. The Amplified Version renders the text like this, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us and made us fit. I want to tell you something. You see, if an unsaved person ever got into heaven in his unsaved state, he would be like a fish out of water. He couldn't stand it. Why? Because he has never been qualified, he has never been made fit to be there. But I want to tell you this morning, friends, that one of the blessings that the Heavenly Father has bestowed upon us is that God has qualified us and God has made us fit for heaven. In fact, it's another passage of Scripture that underscores the wonderful truth that I am heaven-bound purely on the basis of what God has done for me. God used you to speak to some soul, and that soul has trusted Christ. Don't you think for a moment, don't you think for a moment, friends, that you were responsible for that soul's salvation. You were not. God just used you as a link in the chain, that's all. You know, one of the churches that I ministered in, there was uh, an elderly man that began to come to the gospel meeting. He was over 90 years of age. And he came to the gospel meeting on several occasions. And he came one Sunday night, and he came one Sunday night, and he came with the absolute attention of not leaving the meeting until he was saved. I wasn't there that Sunday. I was preaching elsewhere. And there was another man, an American, and he was the speaker, and after the meeting, he waited behind this elderly man, waited behind, and he trusted Christ as a savior that night, and 
I'll never forget when they, this American preacher met me. Well, of course, he was not really so. He was, he was rejoicing in the fact that this elderly man had got saved. And then he said to me, boy, he says, I can get them saved. A lot of rubbish. Why? Because salvation is of the Lord. And my dear friends, understand this. You know, you know, I ought to be thankful. You ought to be thankful that God has so qualified you and fitted you for heaven. What a blessing. You know, we are partakers of the inheritance. The Father has qualified us and made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance, friends. It's absolutely fitting that children should receive the inheritance and it is proof positive that the Father regards us as being his children. Our relationship to the Father is one that is very real and dear to him. You know, those words, those words to be partakers of the inheritance need my attention just for a moment. You know, many scholars believe that, that there is a clear reference here to the children of Israel. Children of Israel being brought into Canaan from Egypt and entering into the inheritance, inheritance that God gave them. It, it literally reads, the Father has qualified us and made us fit for the portion of the lot. Of course, Canaan represented the total inheritance that God gave to Israel. Each family was given its allotted share of the total inheritance. And our text draws from Israel's experience, emphasizing the truth that each individual believer will be given his portion of the total divine inheritance. And I want you to get this this morning, be encouraged by it this morning. Not one of us will lose out. Not one of us. Every one of us will receive our portion of the inheritance that the Father has qualified us to be partakers of. Father has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints and light. Light is used in Scripture to express knowledge, happiness, purity, and comfort. And it is therefore an expression of the state that will be ours in the glory land in the presence of God where we will enter into our inheritance in the fullest sense. Friends, our knowledge, our happiness, our purity and our comfort on that day will be complete. I often say this and I often say this when uh, visiting homes where there has been bereavement or when I'm asked to uh, minister at a funeral service. And I often say this to the people, I often say, we ne make no prayers for the child of God that has departed. None. We make no prayers for them because they're their condition cannot be improved upon. See that? Husband, that wife, that father, that mother, that child that God has called home to glory. I want you to get the truth of this, friends. Their condition cannot be improved upon. We do pray for the family that's left behind. The family that has suffered the loss. You know, Christianity sometimes is accused of being pie-in-the-sky religion, but that is not so. It is true that, that there are great blessings in store for the Christian in heaven. But I want you to get this bit. God wants us God wants us to enjoy our inheritance in the here and now by faith. My dear friends, 
I want you to get the truth of this. You know, Canaan in Scripture does not represent heaven. A lot of Bible scholars, you know, make that analogy, but it doesn't represent heaven. You know, when the children of Israel entered into Canaan, there were battles to be fought, enemies to be overcome, and a land to be possessed. In heaven, there will be no battles to be fought, no enemies to be defeated, no land to be possessed. We will have entered into all that God has qualified us for and entered into it fully. On earth, we have not fully entered into our inheritance. There are battles to be fought on earth, enemies to be overcome on earth, and there's much land for us to possess. My dear friends, it is our responsibility, therefore, to lay hold on our inheritance by faith. Friends, as believers, we are to live our Christian lives in the light, knowing the truth, experience, happiness, purity, comfort, and joy of the most substantial kind. Friend, God desires that our Christian lives be a foretaste of what our life in heaven will be. And I pray, God, that he will make it a reality in our experience. My dear friends, another thing that we have every reason to be thankful for this morning is the fact that we have been delivered. Colossians 1.13 reads, He has delivered us from the power of darkness, therefore, friends, we have been delivered. You see that word delivered? You know what it means? It means to be rescued. Christian man, woman, in the meeting this morning, do you understand it? You've been rescued. It carries the thought of being rescued by the strong arm of a mighty conqueror. When God sent his only begotten son into the world, he sent him on a divine rescue mission. It comes as a reminder to us that in our unsaved days, such was our state that we needed to be rescued. We needed rescue because we were slaves to sin. We were slaves to Satan. And we were under the sentence of death, eternal death. Friends, whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin, said Jesus. You may not have been a drunkard or a drug addict, or anything as openly enslaving as that, yet, friends, sin just as surely held you in its grip. Some were slaves to their temper. Others were slaves to evil thoughts, to jealousy, to pride. For example, the Apostle Paul was a slave to covetousness. And I want to say this to you this morning, eternity will be an eye-opener for many of us when we fully know and when we fully understand what we were rescued from. Friends, we needed to be rescued because we were under bondage to Satan. Our text speaks of the power of darkness. That word power means unrestrained power. It means unbridled tyranny. Scholars agree that the phrase refers to the tyrannical rule of Satan, the tyrannical rule that Satan exercised over us in our unsaved state. The phrase, the power of darkness, only occurs in the New Testament. In one other place, and that's Luke 22, verse 63, the Lord Jesus used it at the time of his arrest in Gethsemane. He said, when I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. 
Friends, the terrible hatred, the injustice, the cruelty displayed by the religious leaders at the cross manifests that awful hatred, injustice, and cruelty. And it was the awful hatred and injustice and cruelty of Satan and his demons, since it was Satan and his demons that was exercising his control, his tyrannical control over them. You know something, believer? In your unsaved state, Satan exercised that same tyrannical rule over you. Under that tyrannical rule, we were kept in spiritual darkness. At the present time, I'm doing the Bible studies in Port Rush Baptist Church, and I'm doing a wee series in Samson. You remember this, that when the Samsons bound, or when the Philistines bound Samson and took him captive after the locks of his hair had been cut, what did they do with him? They put out his eyes, they blinded him. And Satan employs the same tactic, exactly the same tactic of sinners. My dear friends, he blinds their minds spiritually. Why? Because, friends, he wants to hold them in spiritual darkness until he downs their souls in a crisis hell. And, friends, we've been delivered from that. And my time is gone, long since gone. But I want to say this to you this morning. And I want to finish just by saying this. You see, friends, Satan's rule is characterized by spiritual darkness. Christ's rule is characterized by spiritual light. Satan's rule means bondage. Christ's rule means hope in the face of despair. Satan's rule will result in eternal destruction. Christ's rule will result in eternal bliss. Being delivered from Satan's tyrannical rule and translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son is a very great blessing. And good reason, very good reason this morning on this, the 29th anniversary of your pastor's ministry here in this place, My dear friends, it is very good reason to give thanks to God for his goodness and for his blessing. May God bless us with your hearts.